There are many things in life that are helpful to know, but there's only one thing that we must know. And I hope it's become clear to you as we've journeyed through this book called Galatians, and that is that we must know and believe the gospel. Jerry Bridges once wrote, the gospel is not only the most important message in all of history, it is the only essential message in all of history. Yet we allow thousands of professing Christians to live their entire lives without clearly understanding the gospel or experiencing the joy of living by the gospel. My hope is that this series has brought some clarity to your heart about what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. My hope is also that you see much more clearly that the way that you begin in the gospel, which is by faith, is also the way that you live out the gospel, that we live out the gospel also by faith. This is also how we experience transformation. So as we conclude this series, um, I just want you to know up front, I'm restating the obvious this morning. The most important truths in life are often the ones that are easiest for us to forget. The most important things are often the things that are easiest for us to forget. So here's the truth. The Christian life is the cross-centered life. The Christian life is the cross-centered life. In some ways, following Jesus really is that simple. That if you want to follow Jesus, you have to keep your life focused on the cross. You can say focused on the gospel, but the gospel is only a reality because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and what God validated through the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. So I know most of you are probably thinking, well, yeah, of course, the cross is essential to the Christian faith. And yet, here's my suspicion. My suspicion is, is that there are people here today, maybe many people, whose life is not being transformed daily by the reality of the gospel that is revealed to us through Christ's work on the cross. In other words, what I am saying today is, is that the, the message of the gospel is meant to impact us and it is meant to have an impact on our lives on a regular, ongoing basis. So the question would be, how might you know? How would you know if you're not living a cross-centered life? Well, there are some symptoms. Maybe you are experiencing these symptoms. A person whose life is not focused on the cross is often going to lack joy. A person whose life is not centered on the cross is not likely going to, with any consistency, be growing in spiritual maturity. A life not focused on the cross is going to lack passion for God. Now again, Jordan said it earlier, and I think this is an appropriate statement. In some ways, in our relationship with God, just like our relationships with all people, our passion, sort of the emotional impact of that, is going to ebb and flow. So my encouragement to you would be, look, look, look at the, your life from a big picture perspective. Do I feel passion for Christ? Do I often and regularly feel passion for Christ? Another symptom that maybe your life is not focused on the cross would be that you're always looking for some sort of new technique or new um, truth or new experience to sort of pull all the pieces of your faith together. So when you are maybe in student ministry, we're always looking forward to camp because camp seems to catalyze our emotions for Jesus, right? So that's what I mean. We're always looking for some sort of thing to pull the reality of our faith together. Maybe another symptom of not living a cross-centered life would be that just simply that your relationship with Jesus seems far more legalistic than life-giving. That when you and your heart of hearts think about your relationship with Jesus, you think primarily in terms of rules to keep rather than a life-giving relationship with the creator of the world. I wonder, is your life marked by any of these symptoms? What we've learned in Galatians is that only, only a cross-centered life can deliver us from joyless legalistic thinking when we think about following God. We learn that only a cross-centered life can emancipate us from the crippling effects of guilt and shame and, con and condemnation. We learn that only a cross-centered life can enable us to stop basing our faith on our emotions and our circumstances. We learn that only a cross-centered life can increase our joy and our holiness and our gratitude. You've heard me say before that the gospel changes everything. And this is true only because of what happened on Jesus' cross. The cross is what makes the life-changing ramifications of the gospel come to life. 
And so because Jesus is everything, at least that's what we believe at Community Bible Church, the cross and the cross has proved this. I can learn by focusing on the cross to place more confidence in what Christ has done to make me right with God that I am trying to do by gaining his approval through the way that I live. It depends on Christ and the cross. So join me in Galatians chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 11. This is the last time that we're reading from the book of Galatians in this series. Paul begins, See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Let me stop there for just a minute. Some people think that when Paul writes this that he is giving us sort of some indication of maybe something, some physical ailment that he is dealing with. And so maybe because he has bad eyesight or something, he's writing with really, really large letters. I would submit to you when Paul says, see with what large letters I'm writing to you, he is writing in all caps. Not just all caps, but in bold, all caps. He wants us to understand that what he is about to say is really important. So he's not shouting at us. I know that's what it means when you send an email in all caps. I probably just outed someone. There's probably someone here who writes all their emails in all caps. Please stop shouting at all of us. Um, he's just emphasizing what he's saying here. Verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. The first thing I want to show you from this text is that there is a common temptation we're invited to reject. There is a common temptation to reject. So um, this is something that we're all going to wrestle with, in my opinion. And what we see in the text is that human beings are regularly tempted to boast in the wrong things. I don't know if you noticed this in verse 12, but he said, he said, those who, those who want to make a good showing in the flesh, the people sort of encouraging circumcision, the people who are trying to get followers after them are those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. We are all tempted to boast in the wrong things. Now, boast, it's a word most of us know, but just to make sure we're on the same page, to boast in something is to speak too proudly of it. It is to speak with too much satisfaction in it. Boasting is a cause for pride. People who are boastful are people who brag about something or people who walk with a swagger or people who are strutting around or tooting their own horn. And he says that we all are tempted to make a good showing of our flesh. Now, remember flesh we defined this earlier. Flesh is that part of our hearts that does two things. One, it's the part of our heart um, that wants to keep control over our life. So when you surrender to Christ, Jesus is going to change you, but our flesh continues to sort of wage war against the work of Christ in us. There are days that you're just like, I know what Jesus wants me to do, and your most honest confession would be, I just don't want to do it. That's the part of your heart that wants to maintain control, right? Your flesh is also the part of your heart that, that struggles to prioritize the things of God over the things that you think are important, okay? So what is he saying? He's saying we want to boast in our flesh. We want to prioritize what we think is important to us. Why? Because we all want to look good. We all want to look capable. We all want to be, um, we all think that we deserve the praise of other people. And here's the thing. Even after you confess faith in Jesus, there's a part of us that even wants other people to see us as spiritual. We want other people to see like, oh man, like they've really got their act together or they know what they're talking about. They really know the Bible. And at the root of that for so many of us is just a desperate need for approval. This is, this is why we react certain ways when our kids get out of line, especially in public, and, and we struggle in our relationships with others. Why? Because we don't want to appear to be a bad parent. This is why we want to we 
We want our accomplishments to define us. This is why so many of us work so hard in our vocation or so hard in the athletic field or so or, we, or whatever it is. We want, we want to be somebody. We want to show the world that we have something that's valuable and have something to offer that matters. And so what Paul does here is he reduces this whole theological controversy. The controversy was Jesus plus something is what it means to follow him, right? That, he says that whole controversy is about a common desire to look good or be seen as important. That it all is reduced to that. And so here's what's interesting. Not surprisingly, these religious leaders, these false teachers, even though they were demanding that others keep the whole law, they were actually pretty selective about what laws that they obeyed. <laughs> they, they would pick and choose where they wanted to follow God in obedience, that desire to look good didn't really sufficiently motivate them to keep the whole law. That's why Paul says, I think in verse 13, even those who are circumcised don't keep the whole law. This is actually, you remember that word conceit from chapter 5, verse 26? That, that, that When we talked about that word conceit means vain glory or chasing after, looking for the glory of empty things. Here's the interesting thing about vain glory. A person who is conceited wants the world to think that they are excellent at something. They want the world to think that they are competent and that they got it all together. But they actually don't want to put in the work to be as competent as they want the world to think that they are. They just want to look like something, but they don't necessarily want to, want to actually do all of the work to be what the world thinks that they are. That's vain glory. And that's what these false teachers were guilty of. They weren't keeping the whole law. Now, here's the thing. Before you judge them too harshly, let me ask you a couple of questions. Aren't there, isn't it true that there are times in your own life that you are selective in your obedience to Christ? You ever have moments where you're like, oh man, that's just too hard. Aren't there times in your life where you hold other people to standards that you wouldn't even hold yourself to? You judge them harshly? Aren't there times that you actually allow other people to think that you're better than you are? Amen. These false teachers, they taught that circumcision was necessary because they wanted to look like somebody's. They just wanted approval. Paul says that they were doing it because they wanted to, in verse 13, boast in your flesh. So in other words, they wanted the world to see the rigorous discipline of their disciples and then they wanted the world to praise them for being such amazing spiritual leaders. Even while they weren't actually doing the very thing they were asking their disciples to do. They only wanted others to be circumcised so that they could recruit people to their side. They were motivated by a desire for honor. They wanted to be seen as Somebody, have you ever felt that way? <laughs> yeah, my guess is pretty often. And here's the thing. They weren't just motivated by a desire for approval. They were motivated by a desire for self-preservation. Oh, we can all identify with that motive, can't we? We don't like denying ourselves. We, we, we want to make sure that we're taken care of. Paul says that they... They were trying to make a good showing in the flesh, verse 12, in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross. I love how Eugene Peterson translate these verse, translates verse 12. He says this. He says, These people who are attempting to force the ways of circumcision on you only have one motive. They want an easy way to look good before others because they lack the courage to live by a faith that shares in Christ's suffering and death. Guys, we got, a, we got a really easy way to look good before others, right? We call it Instagram and Facebook, Twitter. I bet the majority of people in here probably have access to one of those platforms. And think about how often that platform is used just simply to make ourselves look good before the world. Paul says, they were doing this only because they wanted an easy way to look good before others because they didn't want the, to, ex, to flex the muscle of courage to really walk by faith that would require them suffering for the sake of Jesus. Here's the offense of the cross. 
because of my sin, I cannot do anything to restore or repair my relationship with God. Have you ever, have you ever been guilty? You were the guilty one of rupturing a relationship. You said something that was hurtful. You did something that was hurtful. You betrayed someone. You lied to them. You broke their trust. Can you think of a time when that happened in your life? Can you also think of a time that in that moment that you realized what you did was wrong? So you like owned up to it and you tried to confess it. You, you confessed it. But no matter what you did, the relationship just never got back to where it was. Now, can you remember the pain of that? And how desperate you were to try to figure out what's the one thing that I need to do to make this right? And you just couldn't. Can you think of that moment? That moment should take you to the cross. Because the cross says, I'm not good. And I don't have the right words to say or the right things to do to make it right. But the one hanging on the cross makes it right in our place. But here's the thing, that reality collides with all the things that happen in our flesh, in our heart. We want, to make, we want to be able to bring something to the table to make it right. And it takes courage to believe that only Jesus can make it right. Tim Keller once said this about the cross. He said, if someone understands the cross, it is either the greatest thing in their life or it is repugnant to them. If neither of those two things, if, if it's neither of those two things, the greatest thing in your life or it's repugnant to you, he said, then you haven't understood it. Like he says, you, you almost have to be on one of those extremes. You can't live in the middle. The cross is either the greatest thing that you've ever experienced and heard or it, it revolts you. <laughs> what do you mean I can't be good enough? What do you mean I can't earn God's favor? And so this brings us to the heart of the matter. What is the common temptation to reject? It is seeking the approval of people over God's approval. Just think about this for a minute. Think about how often if you get this wrong, it is gonna, it is gonna alter the course of the decisions that you make. Like if you get this wrong, if you're motivated by man's approval, how often you will say no to Christ and yes to your flesh. Seeking the approval of people over God's approval is a way of seeking to avoid the cross. Because see, my desire for approval will keep me from the self-denial that is necessary for me to experience new life in Christ. My desire for approval will keep me away from the self-denial that is necessary for me to experience new life in Christ. Why? Because my desire for approval will make me want to earn what only Christ can give me by faith. My desire for approval will lead me to seek honor or become conceited or look down on others, which is to provoke them, or look up to others, which is to envy them. My desire for approval will cause me to reject, reject the neediness and weakness in a desperate attempt to prove that I am somebody, but is the very thing, weakness and neediness, is the very thing that gives me access to the love of God that's found only in the cross. That is the common temptation for us to reject, seeking the approval of man over God. Secondly, what is the important truth to remember? What is the important truth to remember? We see this in verses 14 and 15. He says this, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So again, we all expend a lot of energy in our lives trying to look capable, trying to look good, desperate for the approval of others, which causes us typically to overvalue our accomplishments. It typically causes us to think that what I really need in life depends on me. I've got to get it. I've got to earn it. I've got to accomplish it. Instead of resting in the fact that what I really need in life is found in Christ. And the problem, here's the problem. The problem with seeking meaning and purpose 
in the world is that the world will only manipulate and use you. And that's because, as C.S. Lewis said, the world is enemy-occupied territory. The world is under the power and the influence of the enemy. So that, what that means is this. Because the world is temporary, because the world is corrupt, because the world is broken, because the world is in, in revolt against God, because the world functions as if God doesn't exist, I can never find true satisfaction in the world. That doesn't mean I won't try. Almost everybody in this room has tried, but I'll never find true satisfaction. Only the cross offers a path towards satisfaction and delight. Again, to quote Tim Keller, he said it this way. He said this, The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. So think of it this way. The next time that your critic comes to you and tells you what a loser you are in some area of life, what a loser you are in marriage, what a loser you are in your job, what a loser you are on the athletic arena, what a loser you are in the academic arena, whatever. And that critic may just be your own inner critic or it might be a person in your life. The next time they say, you are blank, you're a loser, you can't do it, okay? Here's the thing, the truth about you in that moment is actually worse than what your critic is saying. The truth is worse. Your critic doesn't even know the truth about you. Because your critic can't see your heart. And so the gospel is this. You are more flawed and sinful than you could ever imagine. Yet at the very same time, at the same time, you are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than you ever dared hope. Astounding, right? So it raises the question, do you believe, do you believe that you are more broken and flawed than you know and yet more loved and accepted than you could ever hope? I might, I might, I, I, I'm very confident that there are people here today who are on one end of that spectrum. You're like, I am not as broken <laughs> as that Tim Keller is saying I am. And on the other side of it, you're like, you, you're so aware of your weakness and brokenness that you think, how could God love me that way? If the gospel is true, more broken and flawed than I can realize, more loved and accepted than I could ever hope, if the gospel is true, why would I boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ? That's what Paul's saying. That's the weight that he wants us to feel. Why? Because only, as we've learned in this book, only through the cross can I be delivered from the power of the present evil age. Chapter 1, verse 4. Only through the cross can I be made right with God by faith. Chapter 2, verse 15. Only through the cross am I given access to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 3, verse 2. Only through the cross am I set free from the burden of the curse of the law. Do you remember the burden of the curse of the law? It's the burden of perfection, right? Right? Only through the cross am I set free from the burden of perfection, chapter 3, verse 10. Only through the cross am I made a son of God and an heir of the kingdom, chapter 4, verse 7. Only through the cross am I given opportunity to live life, not chase after God's will. I don't have to chase after God's will my way, looking for Ishmael. I can chase after God's will his way, looking for Isaac, right? Only through the cross am I given the ability to love people free from self-protection and vanity, Chapter 5, verse 6, only through the cross am I empowered to give generously and sow into the kingdom of God, knowing that if I don't give up, I will reap an eternal harvest. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. All of that is ours through the cross. So now, can you now see how a life centered on the cross makes my life more Christ-oriented than self-oriented? It's only through boasting in the cross of Jesus and as I boast in the cross, the reality achieved for me, he tells me in verse 15, is new creation. What happens as I center my life on the cross of Christ is I experience new creation. Now, I want you to track with me just for a few minutes because he says, he says, through boasting in the cross, I've been crucified to the world and the world has been crucified to me, which, which is to say in a very real sense through faith in Christ, um, I am dead to the world. I am dead to my flesh. I am dead to my sin. That there are, 
there are, it, it's still kicking. It's like the chicken with its head cut off, right? So it's still running around. You know, it's like, it's like the bear that's been given a mortal, mortal wound, but it's still, it's, it's in the process of dying. So we feel the weight of our flesh at the times, right? I get that. I understand that. But here's the thing. This world may be, as Lewis said, enemy-occupied territory, which is why I die to it. But in Christ, the enemy occupation of my heart is over. It is over. So in a very real way, I've been thinking about this this week because of a conversation with a friend. In a very real way, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, through faith, my indwelling sin no longer defines me. It doesn't define me. Now think about, now think about this for a minute, right? Think about how often when you fail, when your weakness emerges, when you aren't the Christian that you should be. So whether you feel that or someone else is telling you that, like, you're such a hypocrite, you're not the Christian that you should be. Think about how often in that moment you think that moment defines you. You think you are the thing that you did. I said I wasn't going to be anxious anymore. I was anxious. I'm such a failure. I, I'm just an, an anxious sinner, right? I, I, I said I wasn't going to lust anymore. I lusted. Well, then that must mean that I'm not, I'm not who I'm supposed to be. No, the, if you're boasting in the cross of Jesus Christ, your indwelling sin does not define you. What defines you is who God has declared you to be in Christ. That is who you are. That's who I am. And the cross-centered life is living in that space. Who am I? What has God declared to be true about me? It is not living in the space of I, I have this weakness and all I can sort of focus on is this weakness or all I can sort of focus on is this sin. It doesn't mean that I pay no attention to that sin. I have died to the world and the world died to me. I might need to continue putting that to death but in the act of putting that to death, it doesn't change who I am. I am a son of God putting something to death, right? The thing that I'm putting to death does not define me. Amen. Which means that all of my religious routines, all of my good works, all of my sincere beliefs are not foundational in my life. Those are not the things that are foundational. What is foundational, what is important is that I am a new creation in Christ. And that only happens, doesn't happen through circumcision. It doesn't happen through saying, I believe in Jesus, but I need to add good works to it. I believe in Jesus, but I need to go to church more faithfully. I need to believe, believe in Jesus, but I need to blank whatever, add whatever. It's no, I have trusted Christ by faith. Now, all of those other things, my generosity, my commitment to the church, my pouring myself into the word, all of that is the outflow of the reality that guess what? I belong to Christ. And these are the means of grace by which I experience Christ. So I want to live there. I want to spend time there. But those are not things that I have to add to my salvation. Does that make sense? You guys tracking? All right. That brings us to the last point. It brings us to the cross-centered provision of new creation. The cross-centered provision of new creation. I just want to sit here for just a minute because here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that we are meant to experience something in the cross-centered life. For too many of us, our relationship, our relationship with God is too cerebral. It is too heady. We're just, we think that following Jesus is about like filling our brains with more information about Jesus like, our, like we're like a Bible encyclopedia or something, Right? It's too heady. And what we say we believe too often doesn't connect with our heart. It doesn't connect with our experience. I want to show you where I think there's an experiential tie here in this passage. Look at verse 16. So he says, And as for all who walk by this rule. This phrase, walk by this rule, it's like the same language of 
chapter 5, where he says, all who keep in step with the Spirit, right? So it's the same idea of everyone who continually keeps in line with focusing on the cross of Christ. Everyone who's boasting regularly, consistently, only in the, boast of, only in the cross. That's what he means when he says, so and all, as for all who walk by this rule. So keeping, staying in this lane of focusing on the cross. Does that make sense? He says, all who do this, Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God, or, or I'd say and upon the church of God. So which is to say is like, as I'm staying in line, I'm going to experience peace and mercy. Those around me are going to experience peace and mercy as we're keeping our, our eyes fixed on the cross. He goes on to say, from now on, let no one's cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Which is to say, Paul's just saying, hey, my own life testifies to the importance of the centrality of the cross. Verse 18, the passage begins as it, I mean, ends as it begins in chapter 1. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. What does God want you to experience as you keep your eyes on the cross of Jesus? He wants you to experience peace peace mercy and grace. And I want you to understand something. Peace, mercy, and grace are not intellectual categories. <laughs> These aren't just definitions for you to file away in your brain. These are an experience to be had with God through Christ. So peace is the idea of completeness or wholeness. It is experiencing the full measure of God's shalom. Peace is what we forfeit when we live for man's approval. We're gonna forfeit peace. We're gonna forfeit a feeling of wholeness and completeness when I live for man's approval because that same man at some point is gonna remind me that I'm not whole, that I'm not complete, that I'm not enough. But the gospel reminds us that I am whole and I am complete. So we experience peace relationally with God. In other words, we, we experience that I am no longer estranged from God. That I don't have to pull back from God in these moments. Even my most foolish moments, I don't have to retreat. Why? Because I have peace with God. I have peace experientially with God. Meaning I don't have to wonder whether or not I am good with God when I sin and I fail. Because the cross says what? You are good. You're okay. Not, not good in the righteous sense. We're good. That's what the cross says. We are good. Put your faith in the cross. Boast only in the cross. So we have peace experientially. We have peace circumstantially with God. Meaning that, that as we walk with Jesus, keeping our life focused on what he has done and who he is, that there's going to be calmness even when life seems chaotic. I'm going to have peace transformationally with God, meaning that God is, is committed to changing me and making me more like Jesus. Guys, that is not just sort of an abstract category to believe in. It is an experience. As you keep in line with this, you will experience peace. He also says you experience mercy. Mercy is not meant to just be an idea. Have you ever contemplated the fact that that God has not given you what you deserve. Have you ever had moments in your life where there should have been one outcome, but there was a different outcome? Do you know what that is? Mercy. Not your cleverness, not your scheming, it's mercy. And that mercy is also the same thing that we will need and experience on that final day when we stand before Jesus at judgment. And what we experience is that as we hide ourselves behind the shelter of the cross, that we will not receive what we deserve. Mercy is an experience. Peace is an experience. Grace is an experience. That God has lavished his favor upon you and upon me, but for a purpose, a purpose. It's meant to transform us. And here's what Paul wants us to get. Circumcision and uncircumcision and all of our religious good deeds do not have the power to give us the experience of peace, mercy, and grace. Oh, some of the most graceless, merciless, 
angry people in the world are religious people. Because they've not experienced God through the cross. New creation doesn't come from trying harder. It doesn't come from thinking that all of my transformation depends on my effort. New creation happens as I boast only in the cross and I experience the peace and the grace and the mercy of God. And how do I know that I've experienced peace, grace, and mercy? Flip over to chapter 5, verse 6. This is how you'll know that you've experienced peace, grace, and mercy. He says this. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith, courageous faith, working through love. Those who have experienced peace, mercy, and grace will express their faith through love. Love that enables them to resist sinful reactivity Love that enables them to choose not to exploit others. Love that enables them not to destroy their relationships through self-preservation. Love that enables them to bear each other's burdens. What I hope you see very clearly is that the cross-centered life must be our priority. So here's how I want to end this message because I'm guessing that you're probably thinking, okay, great, I agree with you. I was convinced 20 minutes ago. So how do I live a cross-centered life? Well, I think a cross-centered life is made up of cross-centered days. And so I just want to, just five very brief, very simple ways for you to reflect on the cross every day. The cross-centered life is made up of cross-centered days. These aren't original with me. I'll be honest with you, probably the majority, 90% of the things that I think I ever say is not because I came up with it, it's because of something I read, I heard, or whatnot. So this is the same. But here are these five very, very simple ways to live a cross-centered day that leads you to a cross-centered life. The first is to memorize the gospel. Memorize the gospel. Psalm 11911 says that we're to store up God's word in our hearts so we might not sin against the Lord. I think that's a really helpful image. In other words, how do we begin to sort of tuck away the promises of God into our heart? Things like 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might be the righteousness of God. Memorize the whole book of Romans chapter 8. Memorize all of chapter, I'm serious, like memorize the gospel so that no matter what you're doing, you can then pull those things out and be strengthened. But what you've hidden away in your heart will help you keep a cross-centered day. Number two, pray the gospel. Pray the gospel. Just, I mean, just acknowledge Jesus' work on the cross is the very thing that even makes your prayers possible. So before you get to, hey, God, I need, God, I want, God, can you? It's like, God, Jesus, you made this possible through your work on the cross. And that through work, your work on the cross, I, don't, I can stand here confidently in your presence. And I can ask boldly and, I, and thank him that because of the cross, guess what? You'll never be separated from God. He always hears you. Pray the gospel. Memorize the gospel. Pray the gospel. Third, sing the gospel. Sing the gospel. Not every Christian song is, or not all Christian songs are created equal. Um, <laughs> sing sing cross-centered songs. I'm not saying songs that focus on what, what you need and what you want are bad. I'm just saying you need to bring some balance to singing songs about what you want and what you need and sing songs about what Christ has done. And can I, can I make one small pastoral plea as I'm on this point? I want us to value singing the gospel together. I know that not all of you are good singers. That's fine. This isn't an audition for American Idol, right? Can we value singing the gospel together? A lot of you are like, yeah, we can do that. Well, let me tell you what has to happen for that to happen. Okay, you ready? You got to show up on time. <laughs> I'm serious. If we start at 11 o'clock and you're not getting here till 11 o'clock, we can't value singing the gospel together. Like if we start at 11, get here at 1045. Show up on time. Sing loud. 
Sing emotively. Don't check out because you don't like the songs. I'm serious. If there's a song that you love about the cross, come talk to me and Jordan about it. Don't worry about what you sound like. If you're worried that you're going to distract your neighbor, that's your neighbor's problem. Your worship isn't for your neighbor. It's not for your neighbor. I mean that. And if you are distracted because Jim Smith right beside you can't sing, well, then go sit somewhere else, right? But sing the gospel together. You Listen to me. You will remember what you sing longer than you remember what you memorize. Okay? Number four. Review how the gospel has changed you. Review how the gospel has changed you. We all want to forget our past. I get it. But one way to draw near to the blazing fire of the cross is simply to remember how God has changed you. How often the Apostle Paul, as he's writing, he says, I was once, I once was a blasphemer. I once was a murderer. I once was, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But Christ has what? He's changed me, right? Remember what you once were. Thank God for changing you and then place your hope in this reality. The same God who rewrote your past is also writing your future. And he's with you in your present. Review how God has changed you. Here's number five for a cross-centered day. Live the gospel. Live the gospel. I, of course, do not mean be Jesus for others. You can't atone for the sin of other people. You can't die in their place. But what you can do is demonstrate to a watching world what it looks like to be crucified with Christ. Do you remember Paul's very own words in Galatians chapter 2? Guys, this is the testimony of every Christian. It's supposed to be anyway. I no longer live. So go back to this common temptation because the common temptation is rooted to I live. The desire for approval is all wrapped up in I live. That's what it is. And Paul says, if I know Jesus, chapter two, verse 20, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God. I live with courage because of what Christ has done for me. Live the gospel. Because he loved me and gave himself for me. The Christian life is the cross-centered life. So here's what we're gonna do before we celebrate new life, new creation life and baptism. We're gonna sing the gospel together. And let's sing it like we believe it, like it matters to us. And here's the thing, if you can't do that, and by the way, your can't doing it has nothing to do with how good you sing. Like, but if I mean like from, from a heart posture, if you can't sing the gospel because it matters to you, then as we sing, pray, Jesus, make this real to me. Make this real to me. Make it realer to me than it is right now. And let the song of the saints wash over you. But if it has changed you, let's sing the gospel. Would you stand with us? I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone.
Oh, praise. Oh. 